Hello, and thank you for attending our Moms Clean Air Force Pennsylvania webinar of Opportunities for Environmental Equity, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, also known as REGI and beyond. My name is Heather Mintier Tony, and I serve as the Climate Justice Liaison for the Environmental Defense Fund and Senior Advisor to Moms Clean Air Force. And I'm so happy and excited that you joined us here today for this very, very important opportunity to discuss real issues that are important to our communities, but particularly our friends in Pennsylvania, our communities around the region, as well as the globe. This is an exciting time for all of us to really dig deep and look at a variety of, of environmental opportunities across our country. And so today, I hope we all have an, a chance to seriously sit and dig deep and really think about the different ways that we can come together and work together. Collaborative efforts are some of my favorites. It's some of the most creative ways that we can determine in our own communities how best we work together and look at opportunities to truly draw the best of the environment and correct climate issues that we see often happening around our communities each and every day. We see collaborations through the way that our children work together, the way that we meet in various places, whether it's the grocery store, at church, or even outside on the sidewalk. Collaborative efforts work in our communities, and environmentalism is another way that we can really spur these collective places to talk about initiatives that can truly, truly see a clean economy, and clean energy future for all of our children coming forth. That's why environmental justice is so important. A lot of people have said environmental justice got, has gotten a lot of attention over the past few years. What is it? Why is it so critical to this conversation? And why should I pay attention? Well, let me tell you a few things. Environmental justice means that all of us have an opportunity to breathe clean air, to drink clean water and to live in safe spaces where we don't have to worry about the toxic chemicals that may be coming from the land, air, or water. Environmental justice is not limited to just one region, one people, one demographic. You interact with it when you're traveling, when you're going in to and from work, or where your children may be going to and from to play. So it's very important that we all acknowledge and take account of why we should look at environmental injustices and seek to ensure equity in how we're discussing climate and opportunities across our country. Because you never know where you may go, play, pray, or have an opportunity to gauge with people all across our country. At the same time, we know it's the right thing to do. Fairness and equity always gives us an opportunity to improve upon ourselves as well as our communities. And there's so many different faces of environmental justice. And so today, through this webinar with Pennsylvania, we are so excited to look and dig a bit deeper into what makes this community so special, what these various spaces looks like, look like, and then what are the different messages that maybe we haven't thought about and should take account of as we really dig into this issue and look for culturally competent solutions moving forward. I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. So let's just jump right into it and let's hear from our friends. Hi, I'm Vanessa Lynch, a field organizer for Moms Clean Air Force in Pennsylvania. And I'm so excited to be joined today by Representative Summer Lee for our webinar, Opportunities for Environmental Equity, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and Beyond. Uh, Representative Lee was elected to the Pennsylvania Legislature in 2018. She grew up in North Braddock and Rankin neighborhoods of Pittsburgh and currently lives in Swissdale. A graduate of Woodland Hills High School, she went on to study and graduate from Penn State and Howard University School of Law, where she specialized in civil rights and constitutional law. While at Howard, Representative Lee was an intern with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund and a student attorney in the Howard University School of Law Civil Rights Clinic representing and assisting 
indigent clients with civil rights complaints. After graduating law school, Representative Lee was a dedicated organizer, activist, and advocate for social justice in her local community. Her legislative priorities include criminal justice reform, education, health care, and energy policy reforms, which is what we're here to talk about today. She's the first Black woman elected to the State House of Representatives from Western Pennsylvania, and we are so thrilled to have her here today. Welcome, Representative Lee. Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> so growing up in North Braddock and Rankin, what was your experience with air pollution? Oh my goodness. It's, it's the one thing that I think that I remember the most about growing up. Even what I didn't know what it was or you know couldn't quite identify it, I think that that's something that all the people and all the kids, of course, who grew up in the Mon Valley uh, kind of remember most viscerally. Uh, when I was growing up, I, I lived, so I was, I was living in North Braddock, and of course, from on top of the hill, you can look down into the valley and see the mills, uh, you can see the smog, and, and, and of course, all of that. But at any given day, if you drove down Braddock Avenue, uh, we always used to joke about the, the rotten egg smell, but it became so normal to us that A, it was, it was obviously a nuisance and it was annoying and slightly embarrassing, but it also almost became kind of second nature. It became, I think, the equivalent of white noise. <laughs> it was maybe like a white smell in the sense that we all smelled it. And sometimes when um, we would have visitors, you know, our friends from the other neighborhoods in Woodland Hills would come, you know, they weren't used to that smell. And, and you know, it was something that we were constantly explaining. But I remember, I mean, just growing up and, you know, never being able to tell the difference between, is that a cloud uh, that I'm seeing in the, in the background? Or is that, you know, is that smoke or, or steam or mist or whatever they're, they're saying it is coming from the meal. Um, remembering how the, 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 the air, the, the, the smog from the meal would always kind of just blend in to the atmosphere because it was always so gloomy <laughs> around here. Um, growing up in my generation, you know, they talk about how it's so much better. But when I listen to stories from my mom, uh, my grandma and their generations, you know, if you lived in Braddock and Rankin and, and these areas, Homestead, Clareton, you know, the, they'll tell you, our parents' generations will tell you about the times where they used to kind of, their whole days were built around whatever was going on at the mills, whether it was a shift change or whether it was the hour when the young people would come and sweep up the soot um, and what some of them will call it the glitter off of their, their stoops and their cars and just how much that was so a part of our everyday. Uh, so that was really what life was like, the noise, the trucks going by. Um, it was it was just a, a part of our day to day and, and very much so it, it still is, even as people say that it gets better. Now we're kind of just, we're learning more about it. We have more language about it. And we are kind of now, as we're in this advocacy moment of addressing it in a different way, approaching it more community, just very much tired of constantly living with the illnesses that we're now realizing that we've had and are getting because of it, whether it's asthma with the kids, COPD or cancer and, and all of these other respiratory illnesses, really finally finding our voice, not finally, but in a, in a different way, finding our voice to combat it. Now we're seeing about how, you know, on any given day, our monitor has, registers the worst air quality in a nation on some days. So that's been, that's what, what it's been like living it and, and, and really growing up in it. But yeah, it's very much a part of my, my childhood, just, it's so normalized. <laughs> yeah. So what differences have you seen in how Black, Brown, Indigenous, and low-income communities, other communities um, like your own experience air pollution? Yeah. When I, I remember when I first moved out of this area, um, I went to uh, undergrad, I went to Penn State, middle of the state. And then the next time that I did a move was when I studied abroad in France. And just the remarkable difference in breathing and just quality of life. It was, it was so stark. It was so stark for me. And it took so long in my life before I realized that the way that I lived was not normal. But the reality was, is that whether I was home in my own community, right, if I were in the Mon Valley, or if I were going to visit some of my family members in Baltimore or the DMV, you know, PG County, or family members 
black family members, brown family members, anywhere in this country, we were all really living the same kind of reality um, that it didn't dawn on me that that was not, I, I just was not able to make the connection that this was a, a race thing. It was an, an economic thing so much um, back then as I am now. Uh, but the reality is, is that if you're black or brown or poor, you are more likely to live within close proximity to some sort of environmental pollutant, whether it be the steel mills, uh, the coke works, you know, the foundries that we've had throughout the Mon Valley and the Pittsburgh area, uh, refineries, um, plants, those sorts of things. But those aren't the only types of, of pollutant sources that we are around. And, and in other areas where you're black and brown, you may live in homes that are riddled with lead or asbestos. Um, what we saw in Flint, uh, where the water source was, was poison. And uh, realizing that Flint is not the only Flint, it's just the one that has gotten the most attention. But the undercurrent is, is that black and brown and poor people are the ones who are most impacted by this. And I often use the phrase environmental racism when I talk about this, because I think that what we have seen and what we, and what we are kind of accustomed to is an environmental um, advocacy and activism that is very much kind of centered in white, it, it, it has a white face to it, oftentimes white, middle-class, suburban even. And, uh, but the reality is that the people who are most impacted are folks of the global South. So even as we talk about the environmental racism that we might experience in the Mon Valley as opposed to more affluent suburbs in the Commonwealth, ours is, is, is even still not registering as high as the environmental degradation and the impacts of that, that we're seeing in the global South where the population is majority black and brown uh, and the impacts that we're seeing from that. So I made my campaign and I really centered my campaign around that, around the interconnectivity of environmental racism, about how these are not accidental, the, 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 the locations of black communities, brown communities and poor communities, how it's cyclical, right? Because what we saw is historically our government engaging in practices such as predatory, well, uh, excuse me, redlining, right? And then coupling that with predatory lending and uh, discriminatory loan practices that physically locked black, black and brown people into very specific communities, literally kept them from being able to move to communities where their air quality was better, where their school districts uh, were higher performing. And now seeing how that cycle has played out generationally, um, it's been, a, it's been such a huge part of my advocacy, not just because I live it myself, but because it was the realization of how many people are living it. Um, so the environmental racism and, and kind of traveling with black people, black, brown people, poor people who are more likely to be disenfranchised, less likely to be represented in government, uh, represented on boards, uh, the DEP, um, different uh, entities, institutions, and um, government bodies that actually kind of regulate these things, that control where this goes, that controls the policy around it. And there's a direct correlation between that and our negative impacts and, and, and the negative impacts for our community, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm always impressed with how eloquent you speak about um, these experiences. And I know in Pennsylvania right now, we've been working on um, adopting or really linking to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or REGI. And Reggie works to decrease carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel fired power plants and to combat climate change. And um, Reggie will also, though, bring in an estimated $300 million per year to Pennsylvania. So, how would or could this initiative impact families in your district and in areas where um, they're experiencing these sort of disproportionate impacts? And, and, um, how do we make sure this initiative impacts those families on the front line and in environmental justice communities? Yeah, the thing that's important to remember about um, particularly like Western Pennsylvania, um, Appalachia, uh, this entire kind of region is that yes, while we also have, you know, our very specifically designated environmental communities, which are of course more likely to be black around, um, we're also just a, a, an area that is, you know, uh, we're kind of not, we're obviously not Texas as in the kind of gas, you know, fossil fuel um, capital, but we're not far behind. So even as we tackle some of the kind of regionally specific things that we have in our area that cost pollutants, whether, you know, the steel mills, uh, that sort of thing, we also kind of have the contributions that we're getting 
from other things, um, right? So like um, the plastics energy, uh, industry, um, and, and those are all things that we're combating too. When we think about what, which communities have been able to turn a corner, which communities have not, which communities have been, I would say indebted to kind of extractive industries, have been indebted to polluting industries and which communities have been able to kind of free themselves from that. Um, obviously there are those trends. When we think about the money that can be generated, well, first of all, yeah, to break that down, right? When we think about just the environmental impact of joining Reggie, the environmental impact of moving to renewable energy, of uh, uh, decreasing our, our, our carbon emissions, that is obvious, that is, that's an obvious you know, benefit, right? We're, we're, talking, we're talking the health of our communities, right? We're talking about direct health impacts. We're talking about obviously the, the, the various ways in which this contributes to climate change, weather patterns, uh, catastrophic events that we're seeing, which will not just help our region or the regions that are in this, it'll help the globe. Um, but when we're talking about the money that would be generated and what could happen to frontline communities, if, if for once they were invested in directly, um, if they were able to free themselves of that kind of link that we've had to these extractive energies, uh, excuse me, industries, that is that is a critical piece. Because the reality is, is that you know, your Braddocks, your your Clarens, your your homesteads and Rankins, these communities, you know, that are either in my district or around them, these are communities that have been intentionally divested from. Our school districts, however, are inextricably linked to them because as property values decrease, as people who are moving out of the area because their kids can't breathe, are moving out of the area because you know their their parents and grandparents are getting COPD, right? As our property values decrease, you know our school districts suffer, and oftentimes, you know, the only tax base that our school districts have, you know, would be the meal, you know, or, or things like that. But when we've started to try to think about what does the future of our area looks as other communities are moving to robotics, solar energy, um, the medical industry, we've not been able to turn that corner. We've not had the resources, uh, we've not had the investments, and we've also just not had the leadership uh, that would say black and brown people deserve more than to just be test, you know, test dummies, test lab or, or, or lab rats, you know, for, for industry. So that that's important. And we talked about that often, not just with what was joining Reggie, but also even as we were talking about um, plans for extraction taxes, you know, the severance tax. And well, where would this money, how much of this money would go directly to frontline communities, would go directly to our healthcare, would go directly to our infrastructure? Um, and there was never an answer. So those are conversations that we have to keep pressing because it's just, we know that these frontline communities have been the sacrificial lambs of our region for forever, for so long. Um, but they've also been the, the ones that are while they're benefiting, while the industry that's coming out of them benefits um, communities uh, that aren't impacted by it, uh, we also aren't able to really sustain ourselves, uh, sustain our own region. So that's what's important for, for me. Yeah, I mean, I think when I hear you talk, I hear two things that really strike me. First, the, the sort of um, story of cumulative impacts, right? That that. It's not just that one thing, it's all of these things sort of working together that creates this space where um, some communities are disproportionately impacted. And I, and I think the second piece that really strikes me when I hear you talk is that these issues become um, social justice issues. They grow beyond just the environmental impacts to really that systemic impact, that really um, life altering sort of space where um, it goes beyond the basics of the air we breathe, which is frankly more than enough, but into sort of the way that we get to live. And that's why that's why it's so important that we all, all of us who are, you know, environmental activists and advocates, um, that's why it's so important that we understand kind of the interconnectivity of, of different interests, right? I always say that you can't be in, in, for environmental justice without being anti-racist. Um, you can't solve those, those, those bigger problems that we have around climate justice without really interrogating, you know, our American, you know, racial capitalized system, without interrogating the who's, the which communities are impacted and the why's of that, without talking about our profit-driven industries, um, and without really 
combating that in a very intentional way. Uh, the reality is, is that too many of those communities that are the environmental justice communities are the ones that for various reasons, they're in this space, right? For various reasons, they're indebted to extractive industry. And they're kind of forced to make really unfair choices, right? They're forced to make unfair choices. I hear people in who represent communities of, of color, right? Communities, and these are people who are climate activists. They believe in science. They absolutely want to be able to turn a corner, but then they're also grappling with, well, what do we do to replace this? Who is helping us to replace this? Um, and then we have to really think about, well, would we have these environmental justice communities if our communities that live in suburbs, our more affluent communities took a stand in solidarity and said, you know, we will no longer allow industry, polluting, uh, polluting industry to, to take up house in these communities, to no longer use these communities, these people as, as the sacrificial lamb. And that's the sort of kind of radical solidarity that we're actually going to need if we're actually going to holistically address, you know, our climate needs, uh, not just in the Commonwealth, but yes, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but, you know, kind of all over the country and globally. I think these are all amazing points. I am always so excited to talk with you. I um, learn so much and enjoy just um, your passion for the things that you care about. It's infectious. Um, thank you so much, Representative Lee, for joining us today to discuss the importance of environmental equity and the opportunities, the income from programs like the Regional Greenhouse Gas, Gas Initiative and other things can really provide to these communities who have been disproportionately impacted. Um, I appreciate your time and uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hi, I'm Brooke Petrie, a field organizer for Moms Clean Air Force in Pennsylvania. I'm really thankful to be joined today by Representative Malcolm Kenyatta for our webinar, Opportunities for Environmental Equity, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and beyond. Representative Kenyatta serves the 181st District in Philadelphia. He's a product of the Philadelphia Public Schools and received a bachelor from Temple University, master's from Drexel University, and completed the Harvard Kennedy Schools Executives in State and Local Government Program. Representative Kenyatta currently serves as Vice Chair of the Philadelphia Delegation and as a member of the Governor's Task Force on Suicide Prevention and holds a host of committee leadership positions. As the first openly LGBTQ person of color and one of the youngest members elected to the PA General Assembly, he is deeply committed to creating an equitable and inclusive society. As a legislator, Representative Kenyatta has championed proposals to address generational poverty, raise the minimum wage, protect workers' rights, increase access to mental health care, common sense measures to address gun violence, and protect our digital infrastructure. He lives in North Philadelphia with his partner, Dr. Matthew Miller. Thank you, Representative Kenyatta. We're so happy to have you with us today for this important discussion. I'm so happy to be with you, Brooke. All right. So my first question for you, you know, when we're talking about the opportunities that an, a program like Reggie might present, I think we first need to just talk about the impacts of climate change in general. As the impacts of climate change become more and more evident, we know that those impacts are not being felt equally. So asthma rates in Philadelphia, where we both are, are already more than two times the national average. And rates of asthma hospitalization are five times higher for black children than for their white peers. As a Pennsylvania state representative, how do you see your role in tackling these inequities, both in climate action and other avenues to combat systemic racism? You know, thank, thank you for bringing that up and starting there. Um, I know I've talked to, you know, moms before about what's happening here in my district where prior to COVID shutting down school buildings, we had record numbers of young people being hospitalized with asthma attacks because the air quality is so poor. And anybody, you just imagine what it means to watch a young person uh, who you're taking care of or any young person gasping for air. Um, they can't breathe. 
because we've done nothing to deal with air pollution and we're seeing it in greater pronounced ways with families and with young people who are already struggling in immense ways because of issues that we haven't tackled around income inequality, because of systematic racism, because of redlining and zoning policies that push folks in certain communities, but also then burden them additionally with environmental hazards that repeatedly, um, studies have shown it, and just anecdotally, I think we all understand this, that when you think about the waste uh, processing treatment plant that's in Chester City, um, right in a uh, black community and the rates of asthma and cancer that's happening in, in the community that, that, that surrounds that, that plant. When you think about what other folks have tried to do in other sections of, of Philadelphia, placing environmental hazards there, we've been so lucky that people have stepped up, spoken up, and said, no, we don't want these uh, sort of things in, in, in our community. That is so necessary. That type of activism is so necessary because we have seen a decades long uh, putting in communities where people can least afford it, making their lives uh, you know, worse from a health perspective um, on top of the compounding uh, systematic injustice that we see. And so I talk about this a lot. I often talk about this environmental issues from that, that angle. And I'll just end with this quick note. If you look at a, a study that Rice University did and University of Pittsburgh did, they looked at how communities recovered from natural disasters. And as we see these more extreme weather events, you can imagine what that study shows. What it shows is that Black Americans recover at rates completely lower in most cases, you know, don't recover. Um, and those rates are drastically lower than their white counterparts. And so this is something that we have to have central to any conversation about environmental um, issues. Thank you so much for that extremely insightful and informative answer representative, you know, as the mom of an asthmatic child myself, and I have asthma. So I, you know, when you're talking about imagining what it's like to see your children suffering, you know, I can certainly relate to that, you know, um, and I'm well aware of the rates of asthma in our Philadelphia school district and I just thank you for your words on that because that's a story that's very real for so many parents in Philadelphia. So that brings me to my next question. Um, you know, and you touched on it a little bit, but with nearly 26% of Philadelphians living in poverty, city residents face daily with unhealthy air quality and dangerous temperatures that can be up to 10 degrees hotter than nearby areas with more green space due to the urban heat island effect. How can addressing environmental injustice through equitable distribution of proceeds from programs like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or REGI as we call it, help improve the lives of folks in your district of Philadelphia, in Philadelphia and across the Commonwealth? You know, this is why we have so much work to do because folks who understand the urgent, urgent need for us to do something um, big and make the type of bold investments necessary to deal with the climate crisis. We unfortunately don't have at this point a majority, a robust majority in the General Assembly. And so often what we're doing, what folks who are environmentalists, what we're doing is trying to just be goalies, right? To block the worst stuff. You know, one of the things that I'm, you know, incredibly proud to be a part of is Climate Power, where I serve as the um, statewide co-chair of Climate Power. And we're working day in and day out to make this an electoral issue so that when folks are deciding who to vote for at every single level, that they are asking the question about what candidates' plans are, what their feelings are on how to address you know, what you just bring up, Brooke. And so a part of what I've seen is a very lackadaisical approach to dealing with this. And 
again, who bears the brunt of that inaction? Folks who are from neighborhoods just like mine. You know, the Fair Hill section of my district, average annual income, just under $10,000. Last time I checked, it was 9,783 bucks a year. Just, just think about that. You know, some people spend that on a vacation and we have families who are dealing with this um, for the entire year. Now think about in that same community, the fact that the tree canopy um, has been absolutely, you know, devastated. And there's not nearly enough, especially in certain pockets. If you go from Broad and Lehigh down to 10th and Lehigh, prior to some of the work that this incredible uh, faith leader and environmental champion, um, Revan Aruange, um, who is a pastor in my district, prior to some of the work that he has been doing to plant trees, there were no trees in that whole stretch, not one. And so you see that heating effect that exacerbates issues like asthma, but also for our seniors, it creates really dangerous conditions for seniors who are already on a fixed income. And so we are in a position where, whether it's planting trees, which was this incredible you know, approach that really tied in our, for, for folks who are you know, of any faith, but certainly for folks in the Judeo-Christian uh, community, this idea that we have to be good stewards of God's creation. And I know that you can get outside of the Abrahamic faiths and find folks who also um, have central to their faith tradition or just to their moral um, understanding of the world that we have a responsibility to protect creation. And I, I bring this up because the, the, the Rev has done such a good job of connecting faith and critical work we need to do around the environment. And so that's something that always really sticks out to me, the way he has been able to pull people in who don't necessarily see themselves as environmentalists and say, hey, but you are a person of faith, thereby you, you ought to be and should start to see yourself in that lens. And then here are things that you can do to then be able to actualize that. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, what you're saying is making me think about how you know, where we raise our kids, we were raised, you know, to leave a place better than we found it, right? And if you just boil it down to that, to that central core value, you know, that we all know that that's the right thing to do. So even folks that, like you said, don't think of themselves as, you know, members of the, you know, environmental movement, when you, when you simplify it down to just what do we know is right, you know, it's right there in front of you. And I think that, when we're talking about how the proceeds from a program like Reggie could help improve the lives of folks in these in districts, in communities that have been really born an undue burden for so long, I think it's just so important that we keep that conversation central when we're, you know, when they start discussing where are the huge amount of proceeds from an initiative like this going to go. You know, those conversations need to be happening with the folks in those communities. Um, and I just think it's so important to keep those conversations central and really make sure that everyone is focused on righting these wrongs that have been going on for too long. My last question, again, something you already talked about, the importance of activism. Um, I wanted to ask you, how can the citizens of Pennsylvania best advocate for a state government that puts the health of children, frontline communities, and other vulner vulnerable populations first? What advice do you have for folks? So, so, my, so I, I tell this story a lot, but it, it really represents the genesis, genesis of my public engagement. You know, I was living on this little block in my district, Woodstock Street. And I came home and I'm just complaining to my mom about all the different challenges that I was witnessing along the block. And my mom was sitting there and without skipping a beat, she said, you know what, well, if you care so much, why don't you go do something about it? Go do something about it. And I would say that to folks who 
are looking around and seeing what is going on. Recognize Recognizing the urgent need to act and also understanding that we are in a position economically right now in the state as we, you know, I'm sitting here, we're in budget. We have $10 billion in budgetary surplus, the biggest surplus in Pennsylvania history, history. This is the time to act, to make our communities more, more environmentally resilient, to do things like retrofitting our buildings, to make the types of investments in clean energy jobs and in the technology that is gonna power um, those jobs to make those investments now. The reality is electric vehicles, for example, this is going to be the future. It already is the present in many ways, but you see companies like Ford, doubling down, tripling down on these new fleet of vehicles. Are we gonna allow all these vehicles to be built in Michigan or in Ohio? Or are we gonna say, hey, Pennsylvania, we can build this stuff in Altoona. We can build this stuff in Erie. We can build this stuff in Pittsburgh. We can do it in, in Philadelphia or in Scranton. We have the technology. We have the people power. We have the incredibly skilled workforce that is necessary to do this. But we also can't sit on our laurels, right? We need to invest more in job training programs, understanding that the area where we're seeing the most growth is in solar panel in installers. So how do we put people in a position where they can afford these technologies, particularly low income families who might wanna put a solar panel on their roof? How do we, from a, a, a tax perspective, um, in terms of refunds, but also from a grant perspective, allow folks to do that, and then create jobs that people have been most harmed can actually be a part of the jobs of doing this, of retrofitting those buildings, of doing things um, in our communities like planting trees, which we know can increase air quality as well as deal with heat. What we lack are not enough good ideas on what to do. What we lack is the political will. And the political will is built in part by activists on the ground, folks like moms who are completely dogged, dogged and demanding that we do everything we can, as you said, Brooke, to leave it a little bit better than we found it, a little bit better than we found it. That is our responsibility. And for everybody who's been paying attention, I would just leave you with those words of Kelly Kenyatta. Go do something about it. Do something about it. Thank you, Representative. That was just perfect and such good advice for folks across the Commonwealth to get involved. Just want to thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your insight, your leadership, and taking time on such a busy day to talk about issues that are important to you and your constituents and folks across the Commonwealth. Thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you so much. Talk to you both later. Bye. Thank you all for joining us for our opportunities for environmental equity. Um, today, we are here with Sabira Mahmood, and we are so excited to have her. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Sabira. She is an 18-year-old climate and racial justice organizer, as well as a rising freshman at the University of Pennsylvania. Congratulations. Uh, after discovering her own personal connection with the climate crisis, Sabira realized that the suffering her family had endured in Bangladesh, one of the countries most vulnerable to this climate crisis, could no longer stand. This inspired her to, at the age of 16, found her own climate movement, Philly Climate Strike, which is now known as the Philly Earth Alliance, and we are so excited to have her today to talk about these important issues. Thank you. You're welcome. So my first question is just um, 
as a young person working on environmental issues in the Philadelphia area, what does environmental justice mean to you? Um, I feel it, environmental justice for me means um, that we're approaching the climate crisis differently than how it has been historically and including vulnerable populations that weren't included um, previously. So as we know, like the previous movement was very um, centered around the middle class white um, population, which is obviously not the population that will be affected the most in the climate crisis. So environmental justice for me includes, you know, the indigenous peoples of America and their indigenous sovereignty of, over their land. Because, you know, um, even with the Minnesota pipeline, I believe that's something that's really big that's affecting indigenous people. Um, as well as, you know, environmental um, racism, like redlining and how um, many, uh, because black and brown people are pushed to these uh, lower income environments, they're, um, they're, they're not given the option of like, you know, recycling bins in schools or um, they're in food deserts. So environmental justice includes um, addressing all these intersectional problems that aren't just reduce, reuse, recycle and individual sustainable alternatives. It also like means um, addressing the um, international impact the United States has on the um, crises in like South America, as well as, you know, just countries like Bangladesh. And even about like, um, I bet like, I know this was something that was in the headlines a while ago. I think it was Indonesia, they refused to um, have like the tra their trash um, left in their country. Um, so it's kind of like addressing the climate crisis in a holistic way rather than being like, you know, individualistic actions that like, unfortunately we still do see today because when celebrities are doing their little bit for Earth Day, they're kind of just like, oh, I have my metal straw. This is what I'm doing to save for the planet. What are you doing? But environmental justice is more than that. It like, it, it reveals the complexity of the issue rather than looking at it in like a single facet of like, oh, you yourself have to change then your entire life to make sure that you know we have a sustainable planet one is kind of like putting the pressure on the people who have the power to you know change the direction of our country um because obviously they're not you know using their power for good unfortunately so it sounds like part of what you're talking about and what i wonder if what you're working on in philadelphia is um is making sure that environmental justice becomes more aligned with all aspects of life. So kind of a more social sort of perspective on how we live and how we um, protect disproportionately impacted communities. Yeah, you're right. Um, I feel like, um, unfortunately, there are some environmental groups in the city that are very, you know, white centered and will try to do, like say that they're doing things on behalf of black and brown people but are actually causing a lot of damage. So with myself and others in the movement, and especially in Philly, we're trying to refocus the, um, the movement and kind of like bringing black and brown youth to the front to lead this movement rather than having like white people like who say they're allies, but like instead take our you know, spot at the table and try to lead the movement that we should be leading. So that's kind of like what we're trying to do in terms of Unfortunately, it's a very slow process because there's so many things that need to be done. So for us to like open the conversation, we actually need to be given seats at the table. So that's what myself, um, I'm trying to do as, you know, a South Asian uh, first generation like citizen. And then um, like another organizer of mine, Malcolm, who is a rising senior at Masterman High School. Um, and they're super amazing. Um, so it's kind of like there are so many youth who are trying to like shift this conversation. Um, yeah. Um, how does climate change impact you and your community in Pennsylvania and other um, communities that may be disproportionately impacted by pollution and climate change? Um, unfortunately, I can't speak for the state because I've only lived in Philadelphia, but I can definitely speak to, to my environment in West Philly. Um, so I specifically live in University City, but if you've been to like Philly, um, on New Penn's campus, 
uh, there's so many college students they're always building you know like these apartments and raising the rent prices so when they do that like obviously for black and brown people their you know affordable rent uh, randomly goes to like a thousand or two thousand so they can't afford it anymore and because of like environmental racism, they're pushed into these lower income environments that have these um, power plants that we um, can see in South Philly with the PES power plant that exploded um, in 2019, which, you know, obviously put all these toxic chemicals into the air, which, you know, raised the asthma um, rates and childhood cancer rates in that environment. So that's kind of like how environmental, environmental racism affects our communities. And um, I can definitely see it and feel it in my environment, um, obviously not with the power plant, but when we go more west from where I live, I see there's just rows of houses. There's no trash cans, the trash is on the ground. The air obviously is more toxic and um, the sewage isn't even good. Like when rain, when it rains, there's no rain, um, I forget what they're called, but there's nothing to collect the rain. So, you know, the streets are a mess. So it's kind of like these small things that when we see like um, in our environment, especially people who live in these areas or grew up in the areas, they think they're, it's normal, but in reality it's environmental racism um, because they're purposely um, deprived of these you know, small little things that can make their lives way better than before. So as we look to the next generation of environmental work, what do you think is most important or how can we as environmental organizations or advocates support communities who've been disproportionately impacted by environmental injustices and by climate change? I think the future of the environmental movement has to center black and brown people, especially the youth. There's, um, there's a lot of talk and I realized this, you know, like, I'm, I'm not old, but I'm not young. I'm 18, so it's kind of just like crazy because I'm a young adult, but I'm also a child because, you know, being a child, unfortunately, you're not taken serious. And young people experience the world very differently because we have an imagine, we have like this great imagination where we think the world is beautiful and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then when, as we grow up, we kind of like break that, you know, imaginative bubble because we realize, oh, like I'm deprived of this, like because I am brown or I'm black or I'm queer or I'm et cetera. And so it's kind of just like, when we are able to focus on the youth, we're able to get their perspective. And also young people are, you know, leading the movements in so many ways. They're thinking about these incredible ideas that can, you know, change the perspective and the, um, like the way we approach these problems. So when, I'm thinking of the, the future movements. I'm thinking of, you know, bringing black and brown people to the table, especially young people. Because when we think of young people, we're kind of like, oh, they will learn when they're older, um, et cetera, et cetera. But our life experiences are the reason we're here. Like, obviously I didn't read a textbook and think about, oh, like floods in, you know, Indonesia. And I was like, okay, I, I should join the environmental movement. I thought about my own family. And that's how I joined the movement. So I feel like for the future of the movement, we need to focus on young people and bringing them to the table and valuing them, especially in the same way that we value academics, because while they have the information of, from the textbooks and from their degrees and from their, you know, their lectures and their professors, et cetera, young people are living that. And we don't value that, unfortunately, because I've been in spaces where people are kind of like, oh, you'll learn when you're older. Yeah, you don't want, you don't understand economics or solar power, nuclear power and et cetera. And it's kind of just like, yeah, I don't understand that, but I'm living in, you know, the reality of the climate crisis. My family is living in the reality of the crisis. So while you're arguing in your closed rooms with your, you know, affluent white male privilege, my family in Bangladesh is dying. These young children are not even reaching the age of 10. And you're saying that's so complicated. So I feel like focusing on that is so important, especially because we are out of the room. So you can't see our perspective. So while we're suffering, they can't even notice because it's, you know, obviously silent and that's, that's dangerous. There's something really powerful about hearing, um, hearing that personal perspective of lived experience and um, 
being able to highlight that and bring that to the attention of uh, the people who are making decisions. So I, uh, I definitely understand that and always appreciate that piece of um, working with young people and people from different backgrounds who have different experiences. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate you being willing to do this interview today and um, just enjoyed our conversation and getting to hear about what you've been working on and uh, what you're really passionate about. And I hope that we're able to have future conversations. Of course, thank you so much for inviting me and you know, having such an like, amazing conversation. Hi. I'm Brooke Petrie, a field organizer with Moms Clean Air Forces Pennsylvania chapter. I'm really thankful to have Ethan's story with me today. Ethan is a community advocate with the Center for Coalfield Justice. He holds a JD and a Master of Environmental Law and Policy from Vermont Law School. In his role, Ethan works closely with community members in Southwest Pennsylvania who face both health and environmental burdens that stem from fossil fuel extraction. He also works closely with environmental policy that is moving within the state. Hi, Ethan. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Hi, Brooke, and thanks for inviting me to be here. Of course. So environmental justice, as defined by the EPA, includes low-income communities. You work with the Center for Coalfield Justice, a grassroots organization focused on low-income communities who participated in coal extraction and energy generation. Why do you think including low-income communities in this conversation is so important? And so including low-income communities, and I'll go further of saying frontline environmental justice and communities of color are all important to the conversation as these are the communities who have historically been placed um, with the burden of facing much of our history, history's environmental injustice. They are the communities who have historically lacked the political protection that many others have taken for granted. Uh, They're also the communities who have historically faced the, the lack of financial protection as it has been generally less expensive to operate and develop in such communities. It's important to include these communities as they are people who all deserve the rights that everyone has been afforded. And we must include them to ensure that we don't repeat our past harms and prevent any future harms. Um, and simply by not including them is the equivalent of writing them off as being less than. I'd, I'd also like to highlight that some of the definitions of environmental justice communities, including the EPAs, overlook what some would call overburdened communities of industrial development. For example, a, a community which we represent, Center for Coalfield Justice, Cumberland Township, which is located in Greene County, is not considered an environmental justice community due to its small yet diverse population. Um, but within its 38 square miles, it has two power plants, one coal mine and 122 gas wells. Therefore, it's, it's important to consider more than just income when we are defining what is and is not an environmental justice community. Thank you so much for that explanation and Moms Clean Air Forest couldn't agree more with that perspective. What kinds of programs and regulations can support environmental justice communities and those black, brown, indigenous, low income folks who have been disproportionately impacted by pollution? And how can the environmental movement position itself to make sure that environmental justice is centered in all conversations about the environment and climate change moving forward? So, in terms of programs and regulations, there's a low hanging fruit of the issue of zoning, which allows for certain types of development in designated areas. This is an area that can be addressed on a local level as to limit what can be proposed and actually cons constructed in an area that is known to have certain populations living with them. Uh, but more importantly, is to ensure that we have adequate representation of such populations in the bodies governing these programs and regulations. Uh, the idea of having a member, if not several members of these communities uh, having direct input on how, um, how a program is implemented would allow for significant change and ensure that environmental justice is 
part of these important and, and vital conversations. I, I would like to add that in some cases, it's assumed that many of these communities don't know what's um, best for them or that they may be uneducated or don't care about the issues before them. Um, but we're looking at, but what we're looking at um, are real people who have families and, and work responsibilities just as all of us. So they may not have the time to invest the amount of energy uh, that organizations such as MOMS or CCJ can. So on an advocacy level and centralizing such communities in these conversations, what could be done to best support them is to give them adequate notification of the proposed changes which affect their livelihood, their health, their environment. This includes making the information uh, easily understandable as well. So, so in other words, introduce these communities into the issues from the very beginning. Uh, give them the tools to understand the processes at play, listen to their demands, wants, needs, and in doing so, you start to develop more participatory policy. Uh, and, and that way we're not speaking for anybody, uh, but rather letting these real people who have real concerns about their lives speak for themselves. Absolutely. So in Pennsylvania, I think these things are obviously related. In Pennsylvania, the Department of Environmental Protection is working on joining the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or REGI. Can you tell us a little bit about what REGI is and why it's so important that REGI include environmental equity and speak a bit more about these groups having a seat at the table? Sure, so REGI is a regional cap and invest program which places a uh, limit or a cap on CO2 emissions coming from fossil fuel power plants. And these power plants then must pay for what's called an allowance, which is obtained from a state run auction program. And these allowances accomplish two goals. One, they allow for the power facility to comply under the REGI program and two, they generate funds for the state. And these funds are then invested back into the state to help meet many goals. Um, one overarching goal is to lower and mitigate air pollution. However, there are other ways which these funds can be used. Um, since 2009, 42 coal-fired generators in the state have retired, and 12 others have converted to natural gas since 2011. Uh, a, a decade ago, the state got almost half of its electricity from coal, and it's projected that uh, coal will only make up about 3% of our state's electricity demands by 2030, even without Reggie being introduced into the state. And so these coal jobs, uh, have sustained and sustained so many rural communities in our commonwealth. They, they support and supported the schools, the restaurants, bars, mom and pop shops. So there's no way that Reggie can replace all of that. And, and Reggie is no means a silver bullet for these communities, but the funds generated from Reggie can help. Even if in a small way, these funds can be invested in new job opportunities, which will allow for some to stay and thrive in these communities. Uh, yet for a, a just and equitable transition, our, our local, state, and federal government would need to take a much more aggressive stance in order to, to address such significant issues facing many of our rural communities. That said, uh, the funding generated from Reggie can help many people in our state. Um, we just need the correct mechanisms to do that. Thank you so much for explaining that in a way that's so easy to understand. That's really helpful for folks listening. Well, Ethan, that's all the questions I have for you today. I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me about these issues that are so important for folks across the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Brooke. Well, wow. What an amazing webinar we have had. The Moms Clean Air Force Pennsylvania team wants to extend a sincere thank you to all of our speakers today, we truly, truly appreciate the candor, the diverse perspectives, and the powerful voices that you brought to this table. Now more than ever, it's important for us to stop, listen, and deeply, deeply ingest all of the conversations and ask ourselves, how can we collectively come together? As I said in the beginning, collaboration is important. Through collaborative efforts and deep listening, 
we can really see how we may be able to use the Reggie Initiative in Pennsylvania as an opportunity, as a starting point, and look at maybe some various ways we haven't seen that we could apply in our own state and really make a difference, as we say, into the beyond. And so today, through the wonderful work and words of our speakers, through all of you and the collaborations that you're probably thinking through right now at this very moment, let's take today as a starting point and try some new ideas. See if we can look at some best practices from other spaces, but also take it upon ourselves to dig deep, think through what we've heard, and use this as an opportunity to engage in environmental justice in our own communities in a way that we haven't before. While there's no promise that we're gonna get every single thing that we're thinking about and asking for, we won't know until we try. So I'm glad that you have shared this time with us today. You're willing to try, and we look forward to your participation with us in the future. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.